Is it possible that the narratives, themes, and words that we see in our popular culture can be avenues for God to speak? How can we engage film, literature, music, and theatre with our ears open to the gospel of the kingdom? And can our engagement with art help us to minister in the world more effectively? These are just some of the things I spoke with our guest about in this episode of Theodisc. My name is Kenny Innes, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with Aaron White. Aaron's the National Director of 24-7 Prayer Canada and has a Master's in Theological Studies from Tyndale Seminary. He has been a pastor, missioner, justice worker, and prayer instigator in the downtown east side of Vancouver for the past 17 years. He's a resident theologian at Jacob's Well and the Vancouver representative of the International Association for Refugees. Aaron is the co-author of Revolution and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Kingdom of God. He's the author of Recovering from Brokenness and Addiction to Blessedness and Community. And he's the co-host of the Two Wise Fools podcast. Remember to subscribe to Theodisc wherever you get your podcasts and help us spread the word by sharing episodes on your social media channels. Now, here's my conversation with Aaron White. Aaron White, it's great to have you on the Theodis podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. This has uh, been a long time coming, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. I always just like talking to someone with a Scottish accent. It <laughs> just uh, it makes me feel excited and close to my roots. Well, most people do, you know. It's uh, yeah. it's one of the benefits of having this accent. You get away with a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like that's a that's a pretty solid kind of historical. I think analysis of of Scotland's engagement in the world, you know, there's there's some crimes there. There's some there's some things that Scotland's done, but it's kind of like, no, nah, but you know. Listen, but the other thing that's true about Scotland is that we invented the modern world. You know that. So we we will claim anything as our invention. Yeah, I have heard this. <laughs> I've heard this to be true. Alexander Graham Bell, he's one of ours. Yeah, yeah, no any any remote connection to anything, <laughs> you know. Even if someone has owned like a Scottish terrier, like, well, that's ours. I mean, <laughs> we know where the inspiration came from. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so great. So listen, we're going to have a, a talk today, um, this conversation, really looking at ways that we can read cultural texts theologically mm -hmm. um, that can maybe help us to perceive things with kingdom eyes. And sometimes those two things maybe are held apart. Yeah. But we were going to chat today about ways that those two things can interweave and we can read those movies, books, music, ways that we can integrate those into our understanding of our faith. But before we get to that, three questions so that our listeners can get to know you just a smidge. Mm -hmm. And these are about things that are constants in your life, things that you return to. So the three categories are a book, a food or a meal, and a location. So let's go with a book first. I mean, this is very hard because I read a lot of books and I love a lot of books. But I mean, the, the very obvious answer for me is Lord of the Rings. I I read it usually once a year. Wow. Um because I love it so much and I always find new things in it. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the Lord of the Rings and really anything Tolkien created around that. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan. I, I kind of, I claim my aesthetic around the Astari, the wizards of the, the Middle Earth, you know. Yep. Um, but if I had to go with another book, uh, you know, aside from Lord of the Rings, which is kind of an obvious one, I'd probably say Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek, which is such, I think it's maybe the most beautiful and powerful and challenging contemplative book that I've ever read. Yeah. Recommended. Pick that up. If you haven't read it, you should. Very much. Yeah, very much so. I saw a meme the other day of Tolkien teaching an English, uh, a writer's class. Yeah. Did you see this? I think I posted it. I think I was the one who posted it. <laughs> it was you. Yeah. Uh, just for those listening, it was uh, people asking, so is the way that we begin to write a novel kind of planning out the plot? Tolkien said, don't be a fool. It's developing an entire Elvish language and culture. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Always. That is the starting point. Always. <laughs> is develop the language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a food or a meal that you return to? I think of my my mom's turkey dinner. Mm -hmm. So we do turkey dinners uh, around Easter and we do turkey dinners at Christmas. And, and really when I think of the food that I 
always want to come back to. It's that. It's it's the turkey dinner. It's the stuffing. It's mashed potatoes. It's the veggies. It's the pumpkin pie. The coconut cream pie. Everything. She goes full on. Yeah. With these things, and sometimes does a ham as well. But but I love the turkey. So I think that's probably my go to meal if I had to pick a last meal. You know, uh, before I die, that would be the one. That's the one. Sounds amazing. I do. I always swipe the the leftover trays of stuffing oh, yeah. from our family dinners. I can just sit and eat eat the tray. Oh, <laughs> easy. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's just bread. I mean, it's just a lot of bread. We're just eating loaves of bread, which is really healthy. See, in Scotland, they add sausage into it. So that's the added coronary benefits. Yeah, there you go. Um, And a location or a place. I love, I walk a lot. Uh, most days, you'll find me out walking in places and I have different routes that I love to walk. So, I mean, I'll give you two kind of very obvious ones for me. One is out in nature. There's a, a place in Vancouver called Stanley Park, which is, it's 10 kilometers all the way around and just almost, I think hundreds of kilometers of trails in the middle of it. So I love going and just getting lost yeah. in the middle of Stanley Park uh, with just giant old growth forest trees around me. And I love that very much. And the other is the Regent College bookstore. Uh, if I get to go to a place, I'm like, ooh, I'm going to go there. And if, I, especially if I have, uh, sometimes people give me gift certificates, yeah. which is just my love language, gift certificates to a bookstore. Yeah. So I will go and find myself getting lost in there as well. So Stanley Park and the Regent College bookstore. Sounds amazing. Mm. Brilliant. Well, great. Thanks, Aaron. Now we know you a little bit. So now you are free to talk on the podcast. There we go. <laughs> So we want to get in this idea of talking about how do we, we read cultural texts theologically. And I think one thing that I've found quite a lot, I've spent some time uh, living in the States, um, so it's maybe more common over there. But we have this uh, tendency to separate out or assign labels to different media, like we have Christian music and Christian movies, Christian books, and and then there's secular works. Yeah. What, what do you think about that and what that does to the way we, we think about art? Yeah, I think probably Christian should never be used as an adjective like that um, for for books and music, and uh, partly because a lot of the the the, the art so called that gets put in that category is is really not good, um, and uh, it, I mean it's it's vapid and shallow for the most part because mm -hmm. um, even capitalistically, financially, we know that if we throw Christian in front of something, even if it's not that great, it will find an audience. And um, so that's me being a little bit cynical there, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, I think it's a really unhealthy thing to do. And a really unhelpful thing to do is to separate those things. Um, in in part because I don't I don't see God doing that in his his own flesh, you know, like he incarnates, he embodies himself right into the middle of our humanity. Um, and I think it's it's mostly just stuff that we come up with that we want to make distinctions on. The only caveat that I would give here is I think there is some art, there is some music that that we have used as humans for generations to lead us into the presence of God. And I think that there's something there mm. that we might say that's that's some some sacred art. I think that there might be something appropriate about saying that. So I know certainly in the Orthodox Church, they'll have sacred liturgy and and sacred icons and so on that that have been used for a long, long time by people all around the world for thousands of years sometimes that have helped us, helped usher people into the presence of God. And I think that might be a thin space. I've encountered that, I think, in a in a much more condensed way in some prayer rooms that we've been part of where people have been mm. praying night and day for months mm. and you walk into that space and it feels different and i think it's just because the the people of god the brothers and sisters the children of god have been in that place really seeking out the lord in and through that place and it, and it is just a place but i think it is inhabited by the the prayers and the praise of the people and so i think something happens there and i think something can happen with music and art and literature in that vein but i think stuff that we're just kind of creating now i mean it can be helpful or it can be unhelpful it can be edifying or non-edifying but i think let's be very careful before calling something um christian or secular 
because then we end up just cutting things too fine. And we will probably miss out on quite a lot of what the Lord is actually wanting to speak to us through different forms of art and culture. And that's been a, a problem, I think, you know, a missionary problem for years of missionaries coming to a place and going, well, there's no God here. You know, God wasn't here. So let's bring God in with our our brass bands and our, you know, whatever. And and it's just, I think it's missing what God has already been doing. It's interesting. I was just thinking earlier in preparation for this podcast about um, Chinua Achebe's book, Things Fall Apart. Yeah, where he describes the, the 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 arrival of the missionaries and how they kind of try to take over tribal culture mm -hmm. with a quote Christian culture and the effects of that on people. Yeah, and yeah, you know, I think that's you're right. I think we we miss the potential in art to speak to us in that way. Sometimes I think it's we're trying to protect ourselves or kind of like retreat from what's going on in the world and create our own subculture, oh, yeah. which has its own issues. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's particularly in the States, there's like the Dove Awards, you know, which are the, the Christian Music Awards, because we all know it would be really heathen to listen to the VMAs, you know, the, the, the Video Music Awards or MTV or the Grammys or whatever. And look, it probably is, but it probably is also incredibly heathen to listen to the Dove Awards, because I know some of the background. I know some of the behind the scenes stuff that happens in this Christian music industry. And it is not mm. like it is not God honoring a lot of it and a lot of the songs are again pretty vapid i'm not i don't want to paint that with an entire brush there's some wonderful artists out there doing some wonderful things sure but i find i find myself led more into a place of worship through the music of tom waits or johnny cash or um leonard cohen you know or david ramirez lots of other people who've been or metallica sometimes or you know a, a great great uh, English doom metal band called Ard, you know, I, I Sigur Ross. Yeah. I find myself led into the presence of God and the, whether they're intending that or not, um, I think God is speaking through those places as well. And so, you know, they, I don't have to have it all wrapped up in a, well, make sure the name Jesus is said in the song or it doesn't count. I, I, I don't necessarily buy that. Yeah. Yeah. Sigur Ross, of course, who'd sing in a made up language. Hopelandic. Yeah, hope land. Yeah, yeah, which is a and it's deeply spiritual music. Um, and part of not being able to understand, I think even the the singer not even being able to understand what they're saying, it leaves your mind open to to create a message and to enter into kind of a sense and a feel while you're listening to it. Yeah, and that's an interesting. That lead me on to my next question here about like does does art by its very nature this human creative process does all art have kind of an innate spiritual power to it? I think it definitely has an innate spiritual power, art, qua art, like art actually as art sure. does. Yeah. And again, to go back to Tolkien, he talked about this in his essay on fairy stories, where he talked about the sub-creative task of humanity, that we are not the creators, but in the vein of the creator, in imitation of, in participation with the creator, we make stuff. Right. That's that's what we do. And he had a um, a great book called Leaf by Niggle is a great book describing that whole process as well uh, about the, the creative work, the sub creative work. So I think it all has spiritual power. And I but I think that that power can be used for good or for ill or but like it's it is absolutely powerful and it can be received for good or for ill. So I, I don't think that we can just go, well, all art is just, you know, edifying. Because I don't think that's true. I recently, I was in Switzerland and I went to see the uh, the art exhibit by H.R. Giger. Uh, do you know that artist? You familiar with him? Yes, yes. Responsible for the alien design in the alien movies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So a very creative, very dark artist. And there is some stuff in there that I was really moved by. There's a lot of um, cruciform art that he created. And he was, he was Catholic, at least by birth. Um mm. But then there was some stuff in there that I was like, that's a, that's probably too dark even for me. You know, I don't yeah. think I need to see that. You definitely have some hangups, Giger. And I, I don't know that I really wanted to look into your soul quite that much. <laughs> but even that, honestly, and, I, and I'd be very careful about who I recommend it to. Sure. But even that can be a, a showing the world like here's the darkness that actually is there. Mm -hmm. And there, there can be a power. There's definitely a power in that. I don't know if it's always an edifying power.
when we spoke before, you mentioned the thing about kind of um, the effect of Stephen King books had had on you. Yeah, yeah. Which when I was growing up, it was kind of like there was there was the devil smoking and Stephen King. Yeah, <laughs> the devil smoking with Stephen King, I think, is the idea. Yeah, Stephen King. I mean, he's a really interesting guy. The framework of his stories are are very there is good and there is evil. Mm. And I talk with people a lot about the the kind of modern absurdity that comes from the likes of, of Friedrich Nietzsche, who who said that we're beyond good and evil. And so therefore we create our own value. We create our own meaning because there is no God to create that meaning for us. And 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 all, you know, all notions of good and evil are essentially culturally created in order to make us behave. That's his idea. And it very much has filtered down into our world. So that when push comes to shove, people will ultimately say there's probably no meaning and we just create it for ourselves. Right. Well, Stephen King doesn't believe that. Stephen King believes there is a good and there is an evil, and he really identifies it in his books. And he shows you the power of that evil, but he also shows you the power of that good <laughs> that is supposed to confront that evil. Its job, its responsibility is confronting that evil in a very, very powerful way. That's what the whole book, It, is about and i think they missed it in the movies and it's also I, we were talking about this book salem's lot which is his i think his first major successful novel and it's about vampires and they do not sparkle they're evil and he doesn't mess around about that they are they are spiritually evil they're physically evil socially evil and there's some people who find out about them and they figure they have to there's is their responsibility in this town to try and deal with this and they go to the church and they find this priest who is really, he's doubting his faith. He's an alcoholic. Things aren't going well for him. But he's essentially inspired by this moment as they come and ask for his help. And what follows is, I think, the greatest description of the church militant that I've ever read. I've never read a better description of the church in any theological textbook than when this priest talks about what it means for them to invoke the power of the church against a spiritual evil. He said, are you sure you understand what you're doing when you are asking me to loose the powers of the church against this evil? And he goes on to describe this. But but again, it's not just uh, church victorious. When the priest confronts the vampire, I think we get one of the greatest tests of faith that I've ever read in literature and a failure as well, which only later in several, several books later is is sort of redeemed. So I think Stephen King is is definitely catching on to something here, or maybe it's the Lord speaking in various ways, in hidden ways through what Stephen King is trying to do. I'm careful about who I recommend him to, uh, but but you know I think we can absolutely find evidence of the kingdom of God in his writing. We, we were talking about Paul Simon recently. Mm. Mm -hmm. Paul Simon um, just recently recorded an album called Seven Psalms. And he said that he woke in the middle of the night and, and had a sense whether it was a voice or whatever it was that he was, I think when somebody who's in the mainstream says that they woke up in the middle of the night and needed to record an album of songs of faith, we should pay attention to that. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like God's tapping somebody on the shoulder. Uh, the same thing happened with Nick Cave. You know, he went through a, a, a quite a series of catastrophes in his life and famously wrote the song that starts, I don't believe in an interventionist God, but baby, I know you do. You know, that was an earlier song of his, but then he wrote a series of Psalms and just came out with a book called Faith, Hope and Carnage, I think it was called. Uh, and he's been really just examining again now this notion of an interventionist God, and maybe God is speaking to him through the crises in his life. You know, when you look at the, especially the later works of Leonard Cohen, uh, it's filled with, I mean, even the earlier stuff is too, but certainly the later stuff is filled with faith and Bob Dylan filled. So like when our greatest poets and songwriters are suddenly, usually later on in their life are catching hold of something, we absolutely should be paying attention to that. And I think that divide that you talked about, the, the, the Christian seculars, you know, whatever divide probably prevents us from being able to do that, mm -hmm. from paying attention to what's going on. And of course we have to discern. Yeah. But I think it, you know, it's not everything that that Nick Cave says, not everything that Leonard Cohen says. I'm going to say, well, that's the gospel. But if I have, if I'm really attentive to the gospel and I'm listening to what they're saying, I think I will find some commonality there. Yeah, in his song, "The Lord," 
Simon says this, the Lord is my engineer. The Lord is the earth I ride on. The Lord is the face in the atmosphere, the path I slip on, slide on. Mm. The Lord is a meal for the poorest of the poor, a welcome door to the stranger. But then he also says, the COVID virus is the Lord. The Lord is the ocean rising. The Lord is a terrible swift sword, a simple truth surviving. Something about that feels very psalmic yeah. to me. And the way that that helps us navigate the kind of ambiguities of faith is something I think that we don't always pick up from some of our more homogenized Christian art. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's Job. That's Ecclesiastes. That's Annie Dillard. That's that's what, you know, Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek is. Um, that's some of the, the the best movies that I've watched have that that measure of ambiguity. And I, and I actually think because of a lot of modern Christian worship and art and movies, um, I think that a lot of Christians, and maybe this is primarily in the evangelical and kind of charismatic sp- sphere, I'm not sure, but I think we have trained ourselves out of ambiguity. I think we've trained ourselves to not be able to read things that are complex that are deep, that are troubled. I think we are we are trained to just pay attention to and listen for the resolution that will come after two and a half minutes, mm. you know, and uh, or the the really easy answer, you know. There's I I I just read this yesterday. Leonard Cohen uh, was on some broadcast, some radio show, and they asked him to read a poem, and he read the poem, and then the the person who was interviewing him said okay, but what does that mean? And Leonard Cohen paused for about five seconds and then he read the poem again. <laughs> I was like, that's what it means. I just said what it means. <laughs> you know, like, mm. you're not, it's, we're not looking for the Da Vinci code in here. You know, you're, you're looking, like sit in the mystery, allow yourselves to be overwhelmed by the wonder just for a little bit. You don't have to have all the answers at, by the end of the song. And of course we have the, we have the permission for that you know, in the scriptures. And I think maybe we need to re-engage that permission sometimes in their own lives. Mm. And I'd like us to maybe pivot just a little bit here to talk about how does this then work out? I'm sure you and I could sit and talk about multiple instances we have in our lives or people we know where there don't seem to be any tidy conclusions yeah yeah and i think an ability to uh, engage sometimes ambiguity in art to look for meaning in story how can that help translate into how we navigate our lives or the lives of people that we we love and care for i remember i i, I used to be a, a worship leader i used to sing in, in churches and stuff like that and, and play and i don't really do that anymore but I still like to do that with guys in recovery because mm. um, it tends to be a lot more just honest and vulnerable. And I remember singing a song once called It's Not Enough by uh, Dustin Kensrue. And his song, it, he basically goes through, he's like, if I had all the things the world had to offer, even if I had all the, the blessings of family and childhood and all that kind of stuff, it's not enough. I could walk the world um, forever till my shoes were filled with blood. It's not enough to make me whole. And the, the whole the whole version of the song, the whole theme of the song is it's not enough. It's not enough. And it ends with that. It's not enough. And at the end of the, the time, I, I was, I was, a guy came up to me and goes, <laughs> so then what is enough? What's enough? Yeah. You know, like he really was moved by the song, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't give any resolution, but he wanted to know what is there for enough? Wow. You know, like I think art can take us to that place of at least asking the question. We we have a prayer room in our space in the downtown east side of Vancouver that we create lots of art for. And one of my friends made an art piece and she had had several uh, suicide attempts in her life for various reasons, but it still was still making it through, was still surviving. And she had created this whole art piece on a wall that was essentially an arm and an open wound and it was very graphic it was very like you walk in it was vibrant all the colors were there and you could see it was a it was a, a, a an attempt you know it was an open open wound mm-hmm. 
but there were holes on either side of the the wound and we had yarn and string and rope and you could as you prayed you could tie you could stitch the wound together hmm. so people would would add their yarn in and stitch a little bit of the wound and then write their prayers so on one side they'd be writing their wounds hmm. but on the other they'd be writing their prayers and hmm. And by the end of it, it's this big stitched up wound, this healed wound. Sure. And I was like, I don't, you know, I could preach that, but to walk in and to viscerally experience that in prayer. And she was the only one who could have, I couldn't create that. Not even, not authentically. That wasn't my story, but it was her story. So she could authentically put that on the wall and then we could all engage through her art. So I think there's just so many ways that art can open us up in a way that just expository preaching which is great or or writing maybe maybe can't quite do i was thinking of our friend um ali blackley whittle who does devotions quite often for wtc just through her art yeah and sometimes expressing her journey pulls other people into a recognizing of what god is doing in their lives yeah it's amazing um yeah and then there's this also this idea of the story pulls us out of our individualism yeah but how it releases us from the prison of just the individual moments of our lives mm -hmm. that I w we can see a wider story um that we are a part of can you maybe talk to that a bit yeah i think i think that's incredibly important and and we all do have our individual stories and they matter but there is something about a character or or a scenario when you when you meet somebody and you share that, you're like, oh, I didn't realize that we both encountered that issue, problem, thought, you know, temptation, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I was even I, at the the Sugar Rose concert I went to once. I, I just sat there alone. It was even a miracle how I got to this concert. I, I can't go on. I won't go into it. But I was just sitting there alone, immersed in the sound and their light show, not understanding a word that they were singing as they didn't understand or nobody understood. And I just, I remember even vocalizing, how did you know? Mm -hmm. You know, how did you know that that's what I was going through? How did you know that's what I needed? <laughs> you know, right at this moment. And I, I think the best art and literature does pull us into a more human experience than just the individual. Um, and, and, and speaks well to our common fears that we experience individually, but but we also can learn to experience corporately. There's a, one of my favorite writers talks about this. He says, shared joy is increased and shared pain is lessened. And, and I just think that's you can do that through art as well. You can do that through literature as you realize, oh, someone is, even though they don't know me, they're actually sharing yeah. the pain that I carry or they're sharing the joy that I'm experiencing. I think our inability to embrace um ambiguity or, or or not really knowing how to navigate that you know in our christian testimony we become um stuck in a moment well, that's a good u2 song stuck in a moment that you can't get out of <laughs> <You're> stuck <laughs> in a moment. right so it becomes whatever that that moment where god did a really powerful thing in my life mm -hmm. that becomes the thing that i that kind of defines yeah me yeah and it's difficult then sometimes to talk about, but right now or at this moment or this was a failure or this was hard. Yeah, I think sometimes our that kind of yeah. looking at the way that art functions can help us to embrace the entire story of our lives, the good and the bad. Yeah, I mean that it's a very dangerous thing to be stuck in that moment and to be defined by either a a, a failure or a victory, a tragedy, a triumph. Those are that's part of our story, mm. but our song is not finished. And when I wrote uh, my book, Recovering, I made sure at the beginning, because I tell a lot of people stories with and always with their permission. Mm -hmm. And I just make sure I say at the beginning, those are snapshots of some lives. And some of them will be doing fantastic, you know, as by the point that you're reading this book, or even by the point that it's published, some of them are not doing well. Maybe some of them have died bad deaths. When I was telling a story of some great, wonderful thing that happened, and the bad death doesn't negate the beautiful thing that happened uh, nor does the victory kind of just cancel out the hard things that people went through that's all part of the tapestry of our lives and it's really important that we acknowledge those things um 
and not just the one story. We have a lot of people who get known for their story because they had a really hard story and then they had, you know, a liberation and a freedom. And that's wonderful. But 10 years down the road, if you're still telling that story, um, you've really become encased in the box of that story. And it may not even be true anymore, but you just know, well, that's that's the the credit that I have. That that's the you know the 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 power that is is required of me in order to be on this pedestal and i might disappoint too many people if that was no longer true and we actually hear that a lot from people who are carrying those stories and even people like celebrities carrying certain stories that they can't be honest they can't be vulnerable anymore they can't allow for any ambiguity in their life because they feel like people are holding on to the hope in their story so tightly that if they were to let that down people would be crushed yeah and I think we have to be incredibly careful about that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder if we could just finish with an encouragement from you for people who are listening. Just what are some ways that you find helpful to engage art in different ways with a mind to hearing what the spirit might be saying through them? Probably a good start. And this is uh, from Kurt Vonnegut. He wrote this to a class and I just thought it was so beautiful. Hmm. He said, create art. Like, go make art. But go make it in a way that you're never going to try and sell it or even or even put it out publicly. Just make some art. Just participate in the sub-creative process. Write a poem, draw a picture, sing a song, create something. Because you're then joining God in the creation, in the sub-creation of, of beautiful things. And I think that will help tune our hearts to praise is is in the actual working it out on our own self and then we'll start to pay attention maybe to something that we hadn't noticed before another thing would be to maybe have a listen to or read or or look at art that is outside of the genre that you're most comfortable with starts going well what what am i what am i not seeing maybe it should be you know uh if if you primarily read uh you know european men maybe look at some latin american women that you could read or you know like try maybe try and expand your horizons a little bit because i bet there's stuff uh that has been created that will add to the kingdom story that you get to part perceive in your life um and and i would say just you know ask friends who you like what what moves you where do you see the kingdom in in what art and what you know and talk to me about it people love talking about the stuff that they love so Maybe get some time to do that. I think might be really helpful. Yeah, and I think as well when we then open the pages of scripture, we might be more adept at seeing the artistry that's involved within that. That it's not just a collection of precepts or mm -hmm. um, or descriptions, but that both the writers themselves are are writing in many ways very artistically, yeah. which says something about the God who breathes the inspiration for those words. Absolutely. Uh, I mean. Probably Job, and I've just read this year Robert Alter's translation. He's a phenomenal Hebrew translator. Robert Alter's translation of Job, which he describes as probably some of the greatest poetry ever created. But very specifically, the the best poetry or the second best poetry is put in the mouth of Job. And the, his friends get not the greatest poetry. They get sort of the, the basic proverbial poetry. It's not all that great. But then Job's amazing poetry is actually um, surpassed by the poetry when when the Lord speaks. Hmm. And, you know, just reading that in English, we wouldn't necessarily get that. But but Robert Alter opens this up to us like this is actually a work of art that was very intentionally created to help edify and move us into a new place. Yeah. Amazing. Well, Aaron, thank you for taking the time and... Um... Again, this is, I hope, provoked people to kind of think about this a little bit more. Um, and hopefully in the future, we'll get you back on and uh, we can talk about a myriad of other things. But I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on, on this. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Kenny. It was a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Aaron and Kenny, for opening our eyes to the theological significance of cultural and artistic creations all around us. 
In our next episode, Kenny will be joined by Dr. Sandra Glan of Dallas Theological Seminary, who is Professor of Media, Arts and Worship and has authored over 20 books. They will be chatting about her book, Nobody's Mother, which uncovers the cult of Artemis and its effect on early Christians, which gives us a clearer sense of Paul's instructions to Timothy, particularly around women, and how this led the church to become a type of radical countercultural fellowship. Sounds extremely thought provoking. Theodisc is part of WTC, a theological college that seeks to partner with the church through equipping and sending the whole people of God. Our innovative hub model allows you to study on any of our part time programs without leaving your work or ministry. Come and find out more at wtctheology.org.uk. Thank you for listening to episode 26 of Theodisc. Join us for episode 27 with Sandra Glan as we look at how first century perspectives on women, culture, gender and the arts have shaped our thinking today. Bye for now.